Please subscribe my channel. Round the World in 80 Days Chapter 1 Phileas Fogg and Passepartout I want to forget the name Passepartout a dot. I'll call you Passepartout, said Phileas Fogg. In 1872, the Reform Club in London's Pall Mall was a club for men only. Phileas Fogg went to the Preform Club every day. He left his house at 7 Seville Row at 11.30 in the morning and walked to the club. He had his lunch and his dinner there. He read the papers at the club and he played cards. He left late in the evening and walked back to Seville Row. He went to bed at midnight. Phileas Fogg was a cold man. He didn't talk much, and nobody knew much about him. But everything in his life had to be right. His washing water had to be at 31 degrees Celsius, not 30 degrees Celsius, and not 32 degrees Celsius. At 9.37 on the morning of October 2, 1872, his servant, James Forster, brought him water at 30 degrees Celsius, not 31 degrees Celsius. So this servant had to go. Phileas Fogg sat at home in his Seville Row house. He waited for his new servant. The new servant came. He was about thirty years old. You are French, said Phileas Fogg, and your name is John? No, said the new servant. My name is Jean, Mr. Fogg. They call me Jean Passepartout, because in French a Passepartout can open every door. When things are bad, I can always get out. I can get out of anything. Tell me about your work, said Phileas Fogg. I am a good man and I can do a lot of different jobs, said Jean Passepartout. I was a fireman in Paris. And, look, Passepartout did a high jump, then put his left leg and then his right leg on his head. He was a strong man. But I left France in 1867, said Passepartout, and I came to England. I want to be a servant. I am looking for a quiet life. People say that you are the quietest man in Britain. So I want to work for you. I want to live quietly now. I want to forget the name Passepartout. I'll call you Passepartout, said Phileas Fogg. What time is it? Passepartout pulled out a big watch and looked at IT. IT is 11.29, Mr. Fogg, he said. All right. From now, 11.29 on October 2nd, 1872, you are my servant, with those words, Phileas Fogg put on his hat and went out. There was nobody in the house, then, only Passepartout. Here I am, the Frenchman thought. But what do I do? He went into every room in the house. He found his room, and in it there was a timetable. Everything was there, starting from eight o'clock. Phileas Fogg got up at that time. 8.23 bring tea.9.37 bring washing water, 31 degrees Celsius. 11.30 pf goes to the Reform Club, then, from 11.30 in the morning to midnight, everything was on the timetable. Mr. Fogg always went to bed at midnight. Passepartout smiled. This is right for me, 
he thought. Mr. Fogg is the man for me. Chapter 2 The Bet We are leaving in ten minutes for Dover and Calais, said Phileas Fogg. We are going round the world. It was 6.10 in the evening at the Reform Club. Phileas Fogg was in the card room. He was at a card table with the same five men as yesterday and the day before and the day before that. Phileas Fogg and the five men didn't usually talk when they played cards. But this evening, before the game started, the men talked about a newspaper story. A thief walked into the Bank of England and took fifty-five thousand pounds. Then he walked out again. One of the men at the card table, Ralph, had a very good job at the Bank of England. They'll catch the man, Ralph said. The best detectives are at every port. They know that the man is tall. He wears expensive clothes. They eleven find him. Oh, I don't know, said Stuart, another man at the table. The world is a very big place. It was a big place, said Phileas Fogg. What do you mean, was? Is it smaller now, said Stuart. Yes, said Ralph. I think Mr. Fogg is right. You can go round the world more quickly now, all right, said Stuart. You can go round the world in about three months, but that doesn't mean. Not three months, said Phileas Fogg. Eighty days, Fogg's right, said Ralph. The Rothal to Allahabad Railway, in India, is open now. Look, today's Times has a timetable for a journey round the world. And he showed them, on the centre page of the paper, London to Suez, railway and ship seven days Suez to Bombay, ship 13 Bombay to Calcutta, railway 3 Calcutta to Hong Kong, ship 13. Hong Kong to Yokohama, ship 6 Yokohama to San Francisco, ship 22 San Francisco to New York. Railway 7 New York to London, ship and railway 980 days. Yes, said Stuart, 80 days. It's all right on paper. But a lot of things can happen in 80 days. They can stop you on the way, no, they can't, Mr. Stuart, said Phileas Fogg. Well, why don't you try, Mr. Fogg? Go round the world in eighty days, said Phileas Fogg. All right. I have twenty thousand pounds in Bering's bank. I'll bet all of it. Twenty thousand pounds, cried Ralph. Something will happen on the journey, and you'll lose all your money. Nothing will stop me, Phileas Fogg said. In the end, Phileas Fogg's five friends took the bet. Each person will pay you four thousand pounds, that's twenty thousand pounds. When we see you again here in the Reform Club in eighty days at the end of your journey round the world, said Ralph. Or you have to pay us twenty thousand pounds. That's the bet. Phileas Fogg thought for a minute. Today is Wednesday, October 2nd. So I have to be back here, in this room in the Reform Club, on Saturday, December 21st at 8.45 in the evening. At 7.25, Phileas Fogg said good night to his friends and left the Reform Club. At 7.50, he opened the door of his house in Seville Row and went in, Mr. Fogg? Is that you? said Passepartout. 
he looked at the timetable. This was not on the timetable. We are leaving in ten minutes for Dover and Calais, said Phileas Fogg. We are going round the world, Passepartout's eyes opened wide, very wide. He opened his arms then jumped on one leg round the world, he said, in eighty days, said Phileas Fogg. We have to go now. Now. But your bags? I'm not taking any bags. Well, one small bag. We can buy things on the way. Bring down my coat. Wear strong shoes. Move. At eight o'clock, Passepartout was ready with a small bag. A quiet life, he thought. Where is my quiet life? Phileas Fogg was ready. He had a book under his arm, Bradshaw's, a railway and ship timetable. He took the bag from Passepartout and put a lot of money into it. Then he gave the bag to Passepartout, look after it, he said. There's twenty thousand pounds in it. At the station, Phileas Fogg saw his five friends from the Reform Club. You're here to say goodbye? That's kind, he said. I'll have stamps in my passport for each country. You can see them when I come back. We won't look at your passport, said Ralph. You're an Englishman. At 8.40, Phileas Fogg and Passepartout took their places in the train, and at 8.45 the train started. Some days later, the police at Scotland Yard had a letter from their detective, Detective Fix. Suez, 9th October to Scotland Yard, London I am following the bank thief, Phileas Fogg. Send a warrant to Bombay now. Fix, Detective. Chapter 3 Detective Fix He left London quickly. He had a lot of money in new banknotes. Phileas Fogg was, Fix thought, the Bank of England thief. On Wednesday, October 9th a small thin man waited for a ship at Suez, Egypt. The ship, a fast ship, was the Mongolia. The man was Detective Fix. He was at the port because he wanted to find the Bank of England thief. Fix looked at everybody. He wanted a tall man in expensive clothes. When the Mongolia arrived at the port, Phileas Fogg left the ship. He had to get a stamp in his passport. He went back to the ship. Fix watched him. Can I help you? asked Fix. Then the detective found Passepartout out in the town. Can I help you? asked Fix. You are very kind, said Passepartout. This is Suez? Yes, said Fix. Suez, in Egypt in Africa. Passepartout looked at Fix with wide eyes. Africa, he said. This morning I saw Paris again, from 7.20 to 8.15 in the morning, through the windows of a train, between two railway stations. And now I am here in Africa. You haven't got much time, then, asked the detective. No, Mr. Fogg hasn't got much time. Oh, and I have to buy some clothes. We came away with only one small bag for the journey. I'll show you the way to the shops. Passepartout pulled out his big watch. Thank you, said Passepartout and the two men walked through Suez. I have to be careful about the time. The ship leaves again in a short time. 
You've got time for shopping, Fix answered. And you've got time for lunch, Passepartout pulled out his big watch, lunch, he said. It's 9.52 in the morning. No, it's 11.52, said Fix. You've got London time on your watch. That's two hours behind Suez time. When you go round the world, time changes. On your journey you'll have to change the time on your watch for each new country. What? Change the time on my watch? Never, said Passepartout. Fix smiled. Five minutes later he said, here are the shops. You can buy everything here. I think you left London quickly. Oh yes. Last Wednesday, Mr. Fogg came back from his club at 7.50 in the evening. He usually comes back at midnight. And then we started our journey. Fix thought about that. Then he asked, but where is Mr. Fogg going? Round the world, round the world? Yes, in eighty days. He says it is for a bet, is he rich? Fix asked. I think he is, said Passepartout. The Frenchman was always ready to talk. He has a lot of new banknotes with him, and he buys things all the time. He gave the captain of the Mongolia a lot of money because he wanted to get to Bombay early. So the detective wrote to London and asked for a warrant in Bombay. Phileas Fogg was tall and wore expensive clothes. He left London quickly. He had a lot of money in new banknotes. Phileas Fogg was, Fix thought, the Bank of England thief. Ten minutes before the Mongolia left Suez, Fix was on the ship with a light bag and some money. He was on his way to Bombay. He was on his way to Bombay. Chapter 4 India What? said Phileas Fogg. Are you saying that this woman wants to die with her husband? Phileas Fogg looked at the timetable. Phileas Fogg looked at the timetable. The Mongolia will arrive in Bombay on October 22nd, he wrote in his little black book. But she arrived two days early because there was a northwest wind behind her. He wrote two days early in the little black book, but he did not smile. At 4.30 in the afternoon of October 20th, everybody left the ship and went into Bombay. The train from Bombay to Calcutta leaves at 8 o'clock, Phileas Fogg told Passepartout. Be at the railway station before then slash then he went to the passport office and had dinner at the railway station. Fix went to the police in Bombay and asked about the warrant. He could not take Phileas Fogg back to England without a warrant. But the warrant was not there. It was in the post from England, so Fix could do nothing. Passepartout looked at Bombay. Everything was interesting to the young man. He stood outside the fine temple at Malabar. He liked it, so he went inside. But Passepartout didn't know that you can't go into a temple in India in your shoes. This temple is really lovely, thought Passepartout. He looked at the beautiful things in there. Suddenly three men in orange clothes started to hit him. Then they threw him to the floor and took his shoes. They were very angry. They shouted something, 
but Passepartout didn't understand the language. But the Frenchman was young and strong. He pushed the men away and ran out of the temple into the street. At seven point five 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 minutes before the train left, Passepartout arrived at the station without his shoes, without a hat, and without the bag of new clothes. He found Phileas Fogg at the dinner table. Passepartout moved his arms up Fix was at the station restaurant too. He sat behind Phileas Fogg and watched him. He listened to Passepartout and Phileas Fogg. Passepartout moved his arms up and down when he told Phileas Fogg about the temple. The detective smiled. So the servant did something wrong in this country, he thought. I can use that. The thief will have to stay in India. And I can wait for the warrant from England. Phileas Fogg and Passepartout sat on the train through the night, the next day and the next night. Everything was different outside from one minute to the next minute. Passepartout watched the many changes through the window. They were very interesting to him. Phileas Fogg was not interested. At eight o'clock in the morning on October twenty-second, the train stopped near the station at Rothall. A man from the railway came to the train window. Everybody, get out of the train, please, he called. Why do we have to get out? asked Phileas Fogg. The paper is wrong, because there is no more railway after this. It begins again at Allahabad, about fifty miles from here. But it's in the Times, said Phileas Fogg. He had the center page of the newspaper with him. Look! The paper says the railway between Rothal and Allahabad is open now. The paper is wrong, but your company sells tickets from Bombay to Calcutta, the Englishman said. Oh, yes, the railway man answered. But everybody knows that they have to go from Rothal to Allahabad on foot or on a horse, he was right. The other people in the train knew about the railway. They left the train quickly and went to the village. They took all the horses, we'll walk, said Phileas Fogg. Passepartout looked down at his feet. He didn't have any shoes. His shoes were in the Malabar Temple in Bombay. There's an elephant over there, he said, the man with the elephant smiled a wide smile. A man with an elephant is a rich man when there isn't a railway. Phileas Fogg started at ten pounds an hour. No? Twenty? No? Forty? No. In the end, the man sold the elephant to Phileas Fogg for two thousand pounds. Elephant meat is expensive, Passepartout thought. Next, they had to find a guide. They didn't know the way to Allahabad. That was easier. A young Indian from the village saw them with the elephant. Do you want a guide? he asked. He spoke English, too, the elephant every two hours, the guide stopped the elephant. It ate and drank some water. Phileas Fogg, Passepartout, and the guide sat under a tree, out of the sun. Then they started again. They moved quickly, and climbed higher. By eight o'clock in the evening, they were over the Vindhya Mountains. They were halfway to Allahabad. The guide stopped for the night. 
They started again at six o'clock the next morning, and at four o'clock in the afternoon they were near Allahabad. They were in some trees when suddenly the elephant stopped. They heard the sound of singing and loud music. The guide drove the elephant into the thickest trees. It is a dead man, said the guide, quietly. They are taking a dead man to a temple. Tomorrow they will start a fire and put the dead man on the fire. Through the trees they saw a lot of people. Some men wore the same orange clothes as the three men at the Malabar temple. Some men played music. Some women and children walked behind them. Then they saw a young woman. Some men pushed her in front of them. She was very beautiful, but she was very weak. She couldn't walk very well. Men at the back carried a dead man in fine clothes. The dead man was important, said the guide. The young woman was his wife, and they will put her on the fire tomorrow with her dead husband. What? said Phileas Fogg. Are you saying that this woman wants to die with her husband? Sometimes a wife wants to die when her husband dies, answered the guide. But this young woman does not want to die. Those people, the people in the orange clothes, say she has to do it. No, said Passepartout. But can't she get away from them? They put something in her food, the guide said. Look, she is very tired. Then she will sleep, we'll get her out of here said Phileas Fogg. Please think before you try that, said the guide. These people are dangerous, but, Mr. Fogg, the bet, said Passepartout, Phileas Fogg looked at the timetable. I am one day early. We can use the day well and get the young woman away from here. Well, said the guide. We can follow them, but we cannot go too near. They are going to a temple about two miles from here. I know about the young wife, too. Her name is Auda. Her father had a big company in Bombay. But her father and mother died and she had to marry that old man. We cannot do anything now. But I will help you when it gets dark. Her name is Uda. Chapter 5 Uda The old man was not dead. He stood up and took the young woman in his arm. Then he came down through the fire. People sang and shouted. The noise came through the trees. The guide stopped the elephant and they walked. They could see the temple, white in the dark night. Some men with guns sat round it and watched. The young woman is inside the temple, said the guide, quietly. The dead man was on top of some wood. To the right. When the sun comes up, they will put the woman next to her husband. Then they will start the fire, we'll have to think of something. We have to set the young woman out of there, said Phileas Fogg. But Phileas Fogg and the guide did not have any ideas. And the men with guns round the temple did not go to sleep. They watched. They watched very carefully, after an hour or two the guide said, Mr. Fogg, where is your servant? Phileas Fogg could not answer that. Passepartout was not there, the sun came up in the east. The people woke and went noisily to the wood with the dead man on top. 
Then some men brought Uda out of the temple. She did not move when they put her down on top of the wood next to her dead husband. There was something in her food again that morning. Some men brought fire to the wood. Philea's fog stood up and opened his mouth. He wanted to shout, Stop! Get down, said the guide. They will kill us. But suddenly everything changed. The people gave a great shout, and they fell down on their faces with their eyes to the ground. The old man was not dead. He stood up and took the young woman in his arms. Then he came down through the fire. He walked over the people on the ground. Then he carried the woman easily in strong arms to Philea's fog and the guide. Let's go, he said. Quickly. It was Passepartout. Dot a minute later, the three men and the young woman were on the elephant. Aouda slept and knew nothing about it. The sun was high and hot in the sky. It was nearly ten o'clock in the morning, the young guide said, there, that is Allahabad. The railway starts again there. The train journey to Calcutta is about a day and a night. Philea's fog took a room at the railway station for Oda. He sent Passepartout into the town for clothes and other things for the young woman. When the train was ready, Aouda was better. Before they got in the train, Philea's fog paid the guide dot that's your money, because you were our guide, he said. But you helped us in other ways. Would you like the elephant? The young guide gave a big smile. That was his only answer dot on the journey to Calcutta. Aouda learned about her night in the temple and about Passepartout and the fire. She said thank you again and again, but she was afraid of her husband's family. She didn't want them to catch her again. I'll take you to Hong Kong, Phileas Fogg said, and you can stay there. It was kind, but he spoke quite coldly, she happily said, Oh, thank you. I have an uncle in Hong Kong. He will look after me. The train got to Calcutta at seven o'clock in the morning. Phileas Fogg had five hours before the ship left for Hong Kong. Chapter 6 Calcutta Passepartout felt bad, a bet of twenty thousand, he thought. And we will lose it, because I went into a temple in shoes. Phileas Fogg, Passepartout and Aouda left the station at Calcutta. They wanted to go to the passport office and then to the ship. But a policeman came to them and said, Are you Mr. Phileas Fogg, and is this your servant? Yes, please follow me. Phileas Fogg's face did not change. He didn't feel anything, or he didn't show it. Can this young woman come with us? He asked. The policeman said, Yes. At the police station, the policeman took them to a large room with a big cupboard in it. Then the three men in orange clothes from the Malabar Temple in Bombay came in. One man carried Passepartout's shoes. The temple in Bombay, said Passepartout, the men from the temple were in Calcutta because Fix brought them from Bombay. Fix told the Calcutta police about the Malabar temple. Now, he was in the big cupboard in the room, and he listened to everything, the policeman said. P. 
people from other countries cannot come to India and wear their shoes in a temple. It is not right. You will have to stay in prison. You can tell your story next week. Then perhaps you will have to stay in prison. Fix was very happy about that. The warrant will arrive before then, he thought. Passepartout felt bad. He was not afraid of prison, but he thought of Phileas Fogg and his bet. A bet of twenty thousand pounds, he thought. And we will lose it, because I went into a temple in shoes. Phileas Fogg's face did not change. He said, I want bail. Yes, you can have bail, said the policeman. Fix, in the cupboard, was angry. But, the policeman said, because you do not live in this country, bail will be one thousand pounds each. You will have to come back here in a week, and then you will get your money back. You can tell your story then, Fix was happy about that. He thought, Fogg won't pay two thousand pounds of bail money. He'll stay in prison and wait. To Fix, Phileas Fogg was a bank thief, not a man with a twenty thousand pound bet I'll pay, said Phileas Fogg. You will get this money back, said the policeman, when you come back next week. But now you can go on bail. Passepartout turned to the three men from the temple. Please, he said, give me my shoes back. The Frenchman put on his shoes again. Then Fogg, Aouda, and Passepartout went to the port as quickly as they could. Fix followed. He was very angry. That's two thousand pounds of the Bank of England's money, he thought. I'll have to take Fogg back to England quickly. Chapter 7 Hong Kong Who do you think I am? You are working for those five men from the Reform Club, smiled Passepartout. On the ship to Hong Kong, the Rangoon, Aouda learned a little about Phileas Fogg. She liked him. Fix was on the ship too. He thought about the warrant. Was it now on its way from Bombay to Hong Kong? On the first day, Passepartout did not know that Fix was on the ship too. But then he saw the detective. What is Mr. Fix doing on this ship? The Frenchman thought. We saw him in Suez and now here he is again. Is he following us? Why? Passepartout thought about it, and then he had an idea. He is following Mr. Fogg. He is working for the five men at the Reform Club. He is watching Mr. Fogg because of the bet. Passepartout was angry with the five men, but he didn't tell Phileas Fogg about Fix. The five men were Mr. Fogg's friends. Passepartout didn't want Mr. Fogg to think badly of them. He really liked Mr. Phileas Fogg now. He wanted him to win his bet. It was important to him. The weather was bad and the Rangoon arrived at Hong Kong 24 hours late. Phileas Fogg, Passepartout, and Aouda went to the office of the ship company. Are we too late for the Carnotic J? Phileas Fogg asked. The timetable says she left Hong Kong for Yokohama yesterday, no, said the man at the office. The Comatic had a problem with one engine. She's here. She'll leave tomorrow. Thank you, said Phileas Fogg. Phileas Fogg took Oda to the best hotel in Hong Kong. 
Then he went out and looked for her uncle. An hour later, he came back. Oda's uncle did not live in Hong Kong now. He was in Holland. Oda did not speak for a minute. She sat with her head in her hands. Then, very quietly, she asked, What do I do now, Mr. Fogg? That's easy, said Phileas Fogg. Come to Europe. But I will be one more problem for you. You're not a problem. And you won't change our timetable. Passepartout? Yes, Mr. Fogg. Go to the Kamek, Passepartout, and get three tickets to Yokohama. Passepartout left the hotel with a smile on his face. He wanted to have Ouda with them on the journey. She always spoke kindly to him. To her, he was a friend and not a servant. When Passepartout arrived at the port, he saw a very unhappy Fix by the Comatic. Fix was unhappy because the warrant was in the post from Bombay and not in Hong Kong. The Comatic could take Phileas Fogg away from Hong Kong before the warrant arrived. Passepartout smiled at Fix's face, the fine, rich men of the Reform Club are going to lose their money, the Frenchman thought. And Mr. Fix is unhappy about that, are you going to buy a ticket for the Comatic, asked Passepartout. He laughed, but Fix said nothing, the Frenchman went on to the Comatic, and paid for three tickets to Yokohama. The Comatic's captain spoke to him, the engine is fine now, he said. The problem was smaller than we thought. The ship will leave at eight o'clock this evening. Not tomorrow. Good, said Passepartout. I will tell my Mr. Fogg. He will be happy when he left the ship. Fix came to him, before you see Mr. Fogg, said Fix, won't you have a drink with me in this bar? There was a bar at the port, near the ships, well, yes, thank you. I am quite thirsty, the Frenchman said. Dot I in the bar, Fix asked Passepartout, who do you think I am? You are working for those five men from the Reform Club, smiled Passepartout. You are watching Mr. Fogg. Fix thought for a minute. He didn't have the warrant, and he had to stop Fogg. Yes, I am watching Fogg, said Fix. But I'm not working for the men from the club. I'm a policeman. I'm following Fogg because he's a bank thief. You have to help me, or I'll get a warrant for you too. I'll put you in prison with him. Now, are you with me, or are you with him? Passepartout was angry. With him, he said, and he started to leave the bar. Passepartout was on his way back to Phileas Fogg. Fix had to stop him. Passepartout knew about the ship's new timetable, and Phileas Fogg didn't. So Fix put something in Passepartout's drink. Wait, called Fix. He smiled. Why don't you finish your drink before you go? It's hot out there. Fix smiled again, Passepartout stopped. He looked angrily at Fix, but he took the drink. He sat down and finished it. Then he quietly went to sleep in his chair, Fix left him in the bar. Chapter 8 to Japan They saw a big American ship coming a little way out of the port. Too late! cried the seaman. 
your ship is leaving, Phileas Fogg took Oda to the best shops in Hong Kong. They went from one shop to another shop. He pulled money out of his bag and bought her dresses and other clothes. Then they went back to the hotel. Night came and there was no passepartout. In the morning, too, passepartout was not there. Phileas Fogg and Uda went to the port. Perhaps passepartout was at the ship. But the servant was not there and the comatic was also not there. An Englishman spoke to Phileas Fogg. Did you have tickets for the comatic? The man was fix. I wanted to go to Yokohama on the comatic too, the detective said. She left yesterday evening. We'll have to wait a week for the next ship, Fix smiled. But the detective's smile left him when Phileas Fogg said, But there are other ships in the port of Hong Kong. The Comatic is not the only ship. Let's go and find one. Phileas Fogg looked for a ship for a long time. Ships arrived and stayed. Ships left before he could speak to anybody on them. Are you looking for a boat? asked a seaman. Is your boat ready to leave? Yes. It's a small boat. Number 43. Do you know these small boats? They help the big ships when they arrive at the port. And this boat is the best in Hong Kong. Is she fast? Oh, yes. Eight or nine miles an hour, will you take me to Yokohama? I had tickets for the Comatic, but she left early. I have to be in Yokohama on November 14th. I have to catch the ship for San Francisco there. I can give you a hundred pounds a day, and two hundred pounds more in Yokohama on or before 14 th November. But why Yokohama, said the seaman. We can go to Shanghai, only eight hundred miles from Hong Kong. The ship for San Francisco starts from Shanghai. Then it goes to Yokohama before it goes to America. This was very interesting to Phileas Fogg. That's not in my Bradshaws, he said. Shanghai? And when does the ship for San Francisco leave Shanghai? On November 11th at 7 in the evening. So we have four days. With the wind in the southeast, we can get to Shanghai in four days. When can we start? asked Phileas Fogg. In an hour. We'll get food and water first. Is she your boat? Or a company's? Oh, she's my boat. My name's Bunsby and the tankadier is mine. Here's two hundred pounds, said Phileas Fogg. Then he turned to Fix. Do you want to come with us? Er, well, I er, in half an hour then, said Phileas Fogg, but what about, Auda said. And then she stopped. She was very unhappy about Passepartout, but she understood about the bet. I'm going to do everything possible for Passepartout, said Phileas Fogg. He went with Auda to the police in Hong Kong. He left a letter about Passepartout and money for his ticket back to Europe. At three o'clock, Phileas Fogg, Auda, and Fix were on the Tankadier and the little boat started her journey to Shanghai. The wind helped, and the boat moved fast to the northeast. With the wind behind them, they cut through the sea, very near China, 
but in the early morning of the second day, the seaman, Bunsby, came to Phileas Fogg. There's too much wind now, he said. We get these very high winds near China. They're dangerous, then it started to rain, too, the weather was very bad. The tankadier started to go high up and then down in the sea. Then left and right, up and down in the wind, under a black sky. With the wind behind them and the heavy rain, it was difficult for buns by. But the boat did not go down. Fix was afraid and very unhappy. Aouda watched Phileas Fogg. His face didn't change. It was night. The wind was worse and the rain was worse. Aouda fell before Phileas Fogg could catch her. I'm fine, cried Aouda. Forget about me, Bunsby talked to his seamen, and then came to Phileas Fogg. Mr. Fogg, he shouted above the noise of the wind and the rain. The seaman's face was wet with rain. Mr. Fogg, I think that we'll have to find a port in China. We'll have to stop there, yes, said Phileas Fogg, but which port? Said the seaman. I only know one port, said Phileas Fogg. He spoke quietly, but Bunsby could hear him above the wind and rain. Shanghai, the next day, was better. The sky was blue again. The boat went through the sea faster. At seven o'clock they were three miles from Shanghai. They saw a big American ship coming a little way out of the port too late. Cried the seaman. Your ship is leaving. Phileas Fogg said, use your radio. Say there's a problem. We want their help when the Carnatic left Hong Kong for Japan on November 7th. Passepartout was on the ship. When Fix walked out of the bar in Hong Kong, Passepartout was asleep in his chair. But then a waiter saw him and gave him some water. His head hurt very badly, and he couldn't think. But one word went round and round in his head, Carnotic. Carnotic. He walked very, very slowly out of the bar. He could see the Carnotic from the bar door, and he walked to it. Then he fell down for the last time. The next morning he woke up and he was on the ship. It was a sunny day, and Passepartout watched the blue sea. He felt better. He went to the ship's office and asked for Phileas Fogg. But Phileas Fogg was not on the ship. Aouda was not on the ship. Passepartout sat down. What happened, he thought, and then he remembered. Mr. Fogg didn't know the ship, new timetable. Passepartout thought he will lose the bet because of me, and because of Fix, too. Passepartout remembered the bar in Hong Kong. I will kill Fix, he thought. Passepartout was on his way to Japan. He could not change that. What can I do when I arrive, he thought. I have no money. I have a ticket, so I can eat on the ship, but after that... I'll eat a lot now, he thought, then I won't have to eat in Japan. So he ate Phileas Fogg's food, Aouda's food, and his food, two dot on the morning of November 13th. The Carnotic arrived in the port of Yokohama. Chapter 9 to San Francisco The warrant was there from Hong Kong, but it was too late. Fix couldn't use the warrant in Japan or America. 
near Shanghai, the captain of the General Grant listened to the radio. A smaller boat, Tankadir, wanted his help. The American ship stopped next to the Tankadir. Philia's fog gave buns by 550 pounds and climbed onto the General Grant. He paid for three tickets to San Francisco, and then Uda and Fix got onto the American ship too. The first stop was Yokohama. When the General Grant arrived there on the morning of November 14th, Fogg and Uda went to the Carnatic. But Passepartout was not there. Phileas Fogg and Uda looked for Passepartout in the town. They asked questions everywhere. They only had one day before the General Grant left for San Francisco. Phileas Fogg and Uda walked through the streets of Yokohama, north, south, east, and west. But they couldn't find Passepartout. On their way back to the port, they looked in the gardens. There were a lot of gardens in Yokohama. And in the last garden before the port, they saw Passepartout on a chair in the sun. The servant was very happy. And they all went quickly to the General Grant. I in Yokohama, Fix went to the police. The warrant was there from Hong Kong, but it was too late. Fix couldn't use the warrant in Japan or America. Passepartout saw Fix on the ship the next day, and the Frenchman hit the detective. Fix fell down on his back. Do you feel better? asked Fix. He got up slowly, yes, for now, let's talk. Talk? Yes. I want to help your Mr. Fogg now, oh, said Passepartout. So now you know that Mr. Fogg is not a thief, no. He's a thief and I have a warrant for him. Passepartout started to hit him again, so Fix said quickly, wait. I can't use the warrant here. But Mr. Fogg is going to England. I can use the warrant there. So I want to help him. He wants to get to England quickly. And I want him to get there too. So I can help you now, and you can help me. We can be friends, friends? Never, said Passepartout. But you can help Mr. Fogg. That's fine. I'll help him. A Scotland Yard detective can do a lot of things. But don't tell him about the bar in Hong Kong. And don't say I'm a detective. Then I'll help him, Passepartout thought hard but said nothing. The General Grant had the wind behind her and a good engine, too. On December 3rd, she went through the Golden Gate and into San Francisco. Chapter 10 Across America They heard guns and shouts. Passepartout looked out of the window. The Indians were on fast horses. They had to wait for the train from San Francisco to New York. It left at six o'clock in the evening. Phileas Fogg went with Uda and got a stamp in his passport. Passepartout bought guns for the railway journey. The Sioux Indians were dangerous. At 5.45, Phileas Fogg, Uda, and Passepartout were at the station. The train was ready. And there was Fix again. Phileas Fogg couldn't understand it. They all got on the train. The journey time was seven days. 
Phileas Fogg wanted to catch a ship from New York to Liverpool on December 11th. On the first day, at about three o'clock in the afternoon, Passepartout looked out of the window and saw some buffaloes. He saw hundreds of the big animals and then thousands of them. They walked in front of the train and the train had to stop. Some people on the train were angry because the train had to stop on a hot day. They had to sit there and wait. But Phileas Fogg wasn't angry. He didn't look at his watch. He sat quietly and waited. In three hours, the thousands of buffaloes moved slowly across the railway, and then the train could start again. The next morning, everybody on the train heard the Sioux Indians. They heard guns and shouts. Passepartout looked out of the window. The Indians were on fast horses. They wanted to get on the train and take everybody's money. But a lot of people on the train had guns and they fought. A Sioux Indian killed the train driver. The Sioux wanted to stop the train, but he did not understand the engine. The train went faster, not slower. They were very near the station at Fort Kearney, and there were soldiers there. The people on the train wanted to stop the train at the station. Then the soldiers could help them. B.I.K. somebody had to get to the engine and stop the train. Passepartout called, I will go. He climbed out of the window and then climbed under the train to the engine. The Indians didn't see him. Then Passepartout stopped the engine quite near Fort Kearney. Other people from the train walked to Fort Kearney and talked to the soldiers. The soldiers came back to the train. The Sioux ran away, but they took three people from the train with them. Passepartout was one of the three. Aouda started to cry, but Phileas Fogg said to her, I'll get him back. The captain gave Phileas Fogg thirty soldiers, and they went after the Indians. Fix wanted to go with Phileas Fogg, but Phileas Fogg said, Please stay here and look after Aouda. He walked away, and Aouda watched him. It started to snow, more and more snow fell out of a dark sky. Phileas Fogg and the thirty soldiers did not come back that day or the next night. Fix and Aouda waited at Fort Kearney, but the train left without them. The next morning, Fix, Aouda and the soldiers at Fort Kearney heard a shout. The thirty soldiers were back with Phileas Fogg. Passepartout and the two other people from the train, the train left without us, Fix told Phileas Fogg. The next train is this evening. But that was too late. Phileas Fogg was now twenty hours behind his timetable. They could not arrive in New York by train before their ship, the China, left. Chapter 11 Across the Atlantic I sent for you, Captain, because I want to buy your ship. No. 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 How could Phileas Fogg win his bet now? No ship in his book of ship and train timetables could get him to London by December 21st. In New York, Phileas Fogg looked round the port for a fast ship. He wanted to buy one. He saw the Henrietta and spoke to the captain, Are you leaving New York, captain? In an hour, said the captain. He was a hard man, 
and his answer was unfriendly, Where are you going? To Bordeaux, can you take us with you? No, I don't take people. Look in Bradshaw for a nice ship. I take things from port to port. Fast, asked Phileas Fogg. Do you take things fast? Yes. Very fast. The Henrietta does twelve miles an hour. Will you take me and three other people to Liverpool, Captain? Dot, what's your name? My name's Speedy, and the answer's no. Then I'll buy the ship from you, no. Phileas Fogg thought for a minute. Then he said, Will you take us to Bordeaux? I can give you two thousand dollars for each person? Yes. Captain Speedy thought about it. Eight thousand dollars. We're leaving at nine, he said. Phileas Fogg, Auda, Passepartout, and Fix were on the ship when she left New York at nine o'clock. The next day, December 13th, Phileas Fogg was captain of the ship. Captain Speedy was in his room. And two seamen watched him carefully. He couldn't leave the room. He shouted, but he couldn't get out. What happened on that day was this. Phileas Fogg wanted to go to Liverpool. The captain didn't want to go there, but the seamen hated their captain. And Phileas Fogg gave them some money, so they were happy about the new plan. Now the captain had to stay in his room. Auda was not very happy about it, but Passepartout enjoyed it. Phileas Fogg was a very good ship's captain. Perhaps he was a seaman when he was younger. With her fast engine and the wind behind her, the Henrietta moved quickly over the water, but one of the seamen said, Mr. Fogg, this engine can take us faster. We have to put more wood on the fire. And where do we get more wood? From the ship. They built everything on it from wood, thank you, said Phileas Fogg. I'll have to think about it. He walked round the ship looking at the wood. Then he called Passepartout. Bring Captain Speedy to me. Captain Speedy ran to Phileas Fogg. He wanted to kill him thief, he shouted. You took my ship. Where are we? Seven hundred and seventy miles from Liverpool, said Fogg. But I sent for you, Captain, because I want to buy your ship. No. 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 I'm going to put some of it on the fire, so the engine can take us to Liverpool faster. My ship. This ship cost fifty thousand dollars. Here's sixty thousand, said Phileas Fogg, and he gave the captain the money. Twelve thousand pounds. Oh. Captain Speedy was suddenly a different man. The Henrietta cost fifty thousand dollars, but she was twenty years old, you err. You only want the wood. I'll have the engine, the dotto, yes. I'm only buying the wood. Thank you, said the captain, and so, at 11.40 on December 21st, Phileas Fogg put his fur on the ground in Liverpool. And at 11.41, Fix said, Phileas Fogg. I'm a Scotland Yard detective. Please come with me to the nearest police station. Chapter 12 The End of the Journey Phileas Fogg moved quickly for the first and last time in his life. He hit Fix very hard. Phileas Fogg was in a police station in Liverpool. 
He looked at his watch. Two o'clock. He had to be at the reform club before 8.45. At 2.33, there was a lot of noise in the police station. The door opened, and Fix ran in. He was red in the face. Mr. Fog, he cried. I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. A mistake. My mistake. We have the Bank of England thief in prison. I was on the ship, so I didn't know. Then Phileas Fogg moved quickly for the first and last time in his life. He hit Fix very hard. Fix fell on the floor and stayed there. Passepartout and Aouda came in, and they all went quickly to Liverpool railway station. The London train wasn't there. They were too late. Phileas Fogg paid for a train. They were the only people on it. But when the train arrived in London, the clock showed 8.50. Phileas Fogg was five minutes late. Aouda and Passepartout were unhappier about the bet than Phileas Fogg. This fine man had twenty thousand pounds with him at the start of the journey, and now he had one thousand pounds. He also had twenty thousand pounds in Baring's bank, but he had to pay it to his five friends in the Reform Club. At home in Seville Row, Phileas Fogg stayed in his room all day. He thought about money and made plans. At half past seven in the evening, he came down and spoke to Oda. He was not sad and he was not excited. He looked at Oda and smiled. Oda, he said, "I'm sorry. I brought you to England and now I have these money problems. Are you unhappy now? Unhappy." Said Uda. She couldn't tell him I was rich before the bet. Said Phileas Fogg. I brought you here to a good life, away from your dangerous life in India. But now I don't have much money. But Uda, can I give this money to you? Please. Uda stood up. I don't want any money, but I want to be with you. I want to be your wife. Please ask me. She gave him her hand. Phileas Fogg looked into her beautiful eyes. There was love in them, you know. He asked. Do you know that I love you? Yes, she said. Phileas Fogg called Passepartout, and he came quickly. Mr. Fogg had Uda's hand in his hand. Passepartout saw that, and he was very, very happy. Do you think, Passepartout? Phileas Fogg said that you can speak to Mr. Wilson at my church. Is it too late in the day? Passepartout smiled. It is never too late, he said. It was eight point zero five. For tomorrow, Monday, he asked. For tomorrow, Monday, said Phileas Fogg and Uda. Passepartout ran out. At eight point three five, he was back. He was red in the face, and he couldn't speak. What is it? asked Phileas Fogg. Dot M R. Fogg. Please, Mr. Fogg, tomorrow. You and Oda. Not possible. Not possible. Why? Asked Phileas Fogg. Because tomorrow is Sunday. Monday, said Fogg. No, today is Saturday. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. Cried Passepartout. We made a mistake. We arrived in England a day early. 
But you only have ten minutes. Let's go, Mr. Fogg. You will have to run to the Reform Club. You do it in twenty-five minutes every day, but today you have only ten minutes. Run, Mr. Fogg, run. He pulled Phileas Fogg to the door. Phileas Fogg ran, and he thought about his mistake. Of course. The time changes in every country. When you go round the world to the west, you lose one day. But when you go round the world to the east, you have one more day. But now, was he too late? Phileas Fogg ran through London. Phileas Fogg's friends were at the card table in the Reform Club that evening. When the clock said 8.25, Stuart said, in twenty minutes he'll be too late. The last train from Liverpool arrived at 7.23, and the next one arrives at 12.10. We're going to win our bet. Nobody said anything. They weren't really happy. They didn't really want to win the bet. They liked Phileas Fogg. So they played cards and said nothing. Point eight forty three said Stuart. Point two more minutes. The five men looked sadder and sadder. They watched the door and waited. A moment, a very short moment, before eight point four five, Phileas Fogg opened the door and said quietly, "Here I am, my friends." Now I am a rich man again," said Phileas Fogg. "So I'll ask you again. Do you want to be my wife?" "Yes," said Uda. "But you were a poor man when you asked me. And now you're a rich man again. So do you want to be my husband?" Passepartout did not wait for the answer. He ran to the church and told Mister Wilson. The end.